Welcome to the Man of Recaps. This is Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., the seventh and final season. Welcome back to 1930s New York. Remember, the Chronicoms are trying to conquer Earth and take it for themselves, and S.H.I.E.L.D. being their biggest opponent, they've gone back in time to erase S.H.I.E.L.D. from history. But our agents have a time machine of their own now, built with the help of good Chronicom Enoch. He's been working with Fitzsimmons, but Fitz is off on his own special mission, and Gemma, for security reasons, can't know where he is, so sadly, he's not around this season. But rejoining the team, they also built a life model decoy Agent Coulson. Yes, he's the same old Coulson we know and love. It's just a bit of a shock for him at first to accept that he's dead and now just a robot. And so our gang's all set for an epic time-traveling adventure. Now, one of the reasons they built Robot Coulson is because he's an expert on S.H.I.E.L.D. history. For example, he knows there's a speakeasy that is actually a S.H.I.E.L.D. secret outpost, and the password is Swordfish. Turns out it's run by Grandpa Koenig, yes, descendant of the modern quadruplets? Now, it looks like the Chronicom's plan is to assassinate future president FDR, but turns out their real target is just a random kid named Freddy, so Quake busts in there to save him. Turns out this kid has just been recruited to make a delivery for Hydra. Yes, he is Wilfred Malik, one of the future Hydra big wigs. His delivery is the Red Skull Super Soldier Serum, and if Hydra never rises, S.H.I.E.L.D. never rises to counter it. So you're saying to save S.H.I.E.L.D.? We have to save Hydra. Daisy's of the opinion they should shoot him right now and change history, hopefully for the better. But the Chronicoms bust in, it's a big shootout, and in the end, Wilfred Malik makes his delivery, so history is preserved for better or worse. Now, it turns out our crew can't control their time machine, they're just drifting, following in the Chronicoms' wake. Enoch wasn't at the ship, and they didn't have enough warning, so, oh, he gets left behind! Luckily, he doesn't age, so he'll be time-traveling the slow way. Next up on our adventure is the 1950s. In fact, they're at Area 51, which is a S.H.I.E.L.D. outpost. They bluff their way in by pretending Simmons is Agent Peggy Carter! Yeah, I mean, they both have British accents, it's kinda close. But who happens to be here today? It's Daniel Sousa! Yes, crossed over from the Agent Carter show. He was Agent Carter's partner and brief romantic interest, so he knows this ain't Peggy. But the Chronicoms are here, gonna blow up all of S.H.I.E.L.D. by overloading the science thing. So they fight it out. By the way, Coulson does have super robot strength now. They set off an EMP that knocks out all the robots, including Coulson, and it fries Coulson's color sensors so they have an excuse to do an epic black and white film noir episode. Now, according to history, Agent Sousa dies tonight after making an important delivery, and Coulson's gotta make sure that stays on track. Long story short, they track down the science thing so he can deliver it, but not before he drops a not so surprising surprise on them. I think S.H.I.E.L.D. has been infiltrated by Hydra. You got it? Yeah. And Hydra's infiltrated high up already because his boss in S.H.I.E.L.D. is grown up Wilfred Malik. So Sousa makes his delivery and Malik orders his death and history is preserved with some slight changes. Yes, Coulson, being a robot, can get shot no problem, so he took Daniel's place. It's like, sorry man, according to history you're dead now, but that means you get to join our awesome time-traveling crew. Welcome to life after death. I'll tell you all about it. Now it's time to go to the 1970s, alt right. Now remember, Agent Melinda May had a glorious romance with the real Coulson, but she's very unfazed by Robot Coulson. Remember, she was grievously injured at the end of last season, and while she's always had her emotions in check, now she has no emotions at all. Except sometimes she has uncontrollable outbursts of emotions. Pretty soon they figure out she's got empath powers now, feels the emotions of whoever she's touching. The gang goes back to the Swordfish Bar, where 1970s S.H.I.E.L.D. is having a party. They're celebrating now director of S.H.I.E.L.D., Wilfred Malik, and his new plan to stop threats before they begin, Project Insight. Sounds like Hydra's 40 years ahead of schedule. Yes, the Chronicoms have decided to ally with Hydra to defeat S.H.I.E.L.D., gave Malik spoilers about the future so he could have a leg up. So he's been waiting for our agents, but Daisy takes one of his sons hostage, and they manage to escape with the help of Enoch, who spent the last 40 years as a bartender. Luckily, they've got three years to stop Project Insight, except what's this they're traveling? Whoop, it is launch day. They go to blow the place up while Daisy hacks the security system. Seuss is having a hard time adjusting to the advanced tech of the 70s, and Daisy kind of flirts with him as she blows his mind with 2020 tech. But what's this? They're captured by Nathaniel Malik. Malik. Yeah, three years ago, when Daisy took him hostage, she used her quake powers, and he's like, whoa, I want some of that. So he figured out the Whitehall procedure to take her quake powers for himself. Luckily, Seuss is here to help, and long story short, they escape. Deke tracks down old man Malik, who starts monologuing, but Deke just shoots him. He's like, yeah, I should have done that 40 years ago. But Hydra took hostages. Those are Mac's parents. Mac won't kill his parents. He calls the mission off, and so Project Insight launches. Luckily, our team does have the Zephyr, a super advanced time-traveling spaceship, and shoots it out of the sky. That gives away their position, though, so the Zephyr gets damaged. More on that in a minute. For now, now, though, they managed to rescue Max's parents. This is Agent Rodriguez. Uh, she's my girlfriend. Oh, I don't think these strangers care. Eventually, Coulson figures out that under the lighthouse is where the Chronicom ship has been hiding. He goes into the virtual reality and meets the Chronicom leader, Sybil, the predictor. She analyzes the time stream to see how to influence events. She's like, yo, Coulson, you can't win. I can see the future. And he's like, well, I bet you didn't see this coming because he's still got the big bag of bombs and being a robot has no fear of death, blows himself and the whole Chronicom ship up. So the day is saved, except when Max's dad touches May, she doesn't get an emotional reading from him. His parents have already been replaced by Chronicoms. Mac has to push his mom out the plane! Oh, emotionally scarring. After the next time jump, Mac needs a minute to process, but what's this? The Zephyr is jumping again right away, leaving Deke and Mac stranded in the 80s. Mac spends a year real sad, grows out an epic depression beard, but you know the Deekster, he makes the most of it. My name is Deke Shaw, and I wrote this. 
this song. Yes, Deke has abused his future knowledge of 80s music to become a rock star. But turns out his band doubles as his own crack team of S.H.I.E.L.D. agents. They're working out of the lighthouse with some improvements. And also, guess who survived the explosion? It's Virtual Coulson. Coulson? And not a bunch of ones and zeros trapped in a digital hell? I'd like to think so, but admittedly, there's been some real soul searching here. But the Chronicom survived as well, and they've built themselves some new classically 80s robot bodies, and it turns into a campy 80s horror movie. The only way to beat them is to flip the genre, turn it into a campy 80s action movie. Long story short, it's the best thing ever. They blow up all these robots, but one escapes with the time stream, takes it back to Sybil, who's now working with Nathaniel Malik. So the gang's reunited, but the drive is still damaged. Turns out it keeps warping uncontrollably. There's an energy field around it. The only way to fix it is if someone's fast enough to get in there. Of course, Yo-Yo has super speed, but her powers haven't been working all season, so they've got to go see an inhuman expert at Afterlife. It's Daisy's mom, Jai Ying. She examines Yo-Yo, but turns out there's nothing physically wrong with her. Her block is mental, which means she needs to use May's empath powers to figure out her feelings. Neither of these women are super emotional, so they fight it out instead, and it unlocks her memories of when she was a kid, she came out of the closet, but went right back, and her uncle died. But there's more immediate concerns, as one of the inhumans has escaped. She's got dangerous explosive powers, can't control it, gonna kill herself, but what's this? Stopped by someone with quake powers? It's not Daniel Malik dressed like he's in the Matrix. He's like, come on, baby, join me on the dark side. It's super cool, I promise. But this girl's not just any inhuman. She is Jai Ying's other daughter. Yeah, Daisy's half-sister. She's super angsty right now, though, and starts blasting people. So it's like, hey, we'll deal with this later. We gotta go fix our time machine. Are Yo-Yo's powers now unblocked? Yes, they are. She gets in there and fixes the thing. But wait, what's this? She doesn't bounce back? Yeah, it turns out that limitation of her power was just a mental block, too. She's a full-on speedster now, but the name Yo-Yo no longer makes sense. Unfortunately, that did not fix all the time drive's problems, and oh, they jump again. Daisy wakes up from the medical tube to find out they have been warped out of time and space. Before they can fix it, they warp again, and Daisy wakes up in the medical tube again. Yeah, you know it! It's a time loop episode! But there's a fun twist, because Coulson was in sleep mode, he remembers too. But Daisy doesn't remember. They've already done this almost a hundred times. Every time she dies, she forgets, and Coulson has to explain it to her all over again. And they can't keep looping infinitely, there's a time limit, because they are circling the drain of this time storm, and every loop they're a little bit closer. Eventually, they learn a secret that might be the key. Gemma doesn't know where Fitz is, because she actually has an implant blocking that memory. If she removes it, she might also remember how to fix the time drive, but what's this? She's choking and dies! Someone bursts the pipe and there's a murder mystery! Pretty soon they figure out the killer is Enoch! No, he's not a bad guy. Simmons programmed him to not let her remove the memory blocker no matter what. No matter what they do, Enoch keeps stopping them. They recruit the whole team to help, but he takes them all out. Every time Daisy wakes up, by the way, Daniel Seuss is there sleeping next to her. It's like, hey man, why are you here? And it's like, well, because I'm a nice guy and I really care for you, so they spend a loop making out. Eventually they distract Enoch long enough to get the implant out, and Jem remembers if they use Use Enoch's power core to power the drive, it's an easy fix. But removing his power core would kill Enoch. And the next loop, they're out of time. This is the final loop, so Enoch, no hesitation, sacrifices himself to save the team. So back to business in the late 80s, it's time to liberate Afterlife, but oh, Malik was waiting for him. Yeah, he's been working with Sybil in the time drive, knew they were coming. He's recruited a familiar face to his team, a young John Garrett, the season one villain. And if you're thinking, wow, that casting is spot on, it is Bill Paxton's son. They give him Gordon's teleportation powers and warp to the lighthouse where Daisy's having a heart to heart with her mom. But now it's time for a a quake fight. Giant grabs him to protect her daughter, but oh, he kills her. No, she was still good in this timeline. But turns out the main goal here is kidnapping Simmons. Yeah, they warp back to the Chronicom ship where Sybil explains that all the versions where they lose is because Fitz somehow saves them. To find out where he is, they take out Gemma's implant, which leaves her very disoriented with all her memories flooding back. So Daisy realizes if they can predict the future, the only way to beat him is to be unpredictable. So they fly off to space with no plan. Daisy rescues Simmons, but is stopped by her half-sister. They have a sister fight, but Daisy's like, yo, I don't want to fight you. You should be a good guy. So Cora's having doubts. Wait, are we the bad guys, and Nate immediately turns on her. At the ship, Mac busts out the awesome staff explosion weapon we haven't seen since episode two. They have an awesome escape plan. They duct tape a bunch of these chronicoms to missiles. All of their cores are super explosive, and boom, get out of there. Just then, the rest of the chronicom fleet arrives, and there's no one stopping them now from destroying all of S.H.I.E.L.D. Our team meets up with the survivors of S.H.I.E.L.D., who had instructions in case of emergency to bring all these random pieces to the bar. Luckily, Simmons still brain scrambled, but knows exactly what to do with them. In fact, the final piece is her wedding ring. Oh, this machine opens a portal. Who's this warping in? It's Leopold Fitz. All right. He's like, congrats guys, you did it. See, you changed history enough that it created an alternate timeline, but now we can warp to our original timeline and save it. The team's like, hey, we're not going to just abandon this timeline to being taken over by the Chronicoms. So they form a plan to bring the Chronicoms back with them. Only thing is, one of them would have to stay behind, and the volunteer is Deke, who's kind of a rock star here anyway. So they do the science thing, and whomp, take all the Chronicoms with them, leaving Deke in the 1980s alternate timeline to restart S.H.I.E.L.D. and be a rock star. So finally, we get the backstory of Fitzsimmons' plan. 
Spider-Man. Enoch managed to get a copy of the time stream and Fitz analyzed it Doctor Strange style, seeing all possible futures and figuring out the plan. They got to work building a time machine, but because they're building a time machine, it doesn't really matter how long it took, so they decided to just take some years and live happily ever after. Eventually, though, it was time for action. Fitz had to stay behind in the original timeline while Gemma erased her memory, then saved our crew from the end of season six and warped out of there. So now back in their original timeline, right at the end of season six, our crew has to close the loop. Yes, yeah, Simmons' random helpers were our crew from the future. Meanwhile, the rest of the team infiltrates the Chronicom ship where Quake has her final Quake fight. Sybil from her control center can issue orders to all the Chronicom hunters and our team's gonna hijack it cause May busts in, yeah, the cavalry's here. They grab Korra who's ready to be a good guy now and use her vague powers to somehow boost the signal down to the lighthouse where the Chronicoms are invading. So boom, all the Chronicoms hit with May's new empath powers, gave them emotions so they're like, oh, I'm so sorry, we've been huge dicks. But Quake has to finish off her superpower fight. This guy's pretty strong, but she's stronger. Boom, full unleashed powers, destroys the whole fleet. Does Daisy die in space though? Luckily not, her sister Korra's powers not only explode people and boost signals, but also bring him back to life. Then Fitzsimmons get back to where they left off. Turns out there's a part of the flashback they left out. They had a kid. Oh, Fitzsimmons, baby, so cute. And so one year later, Fitz told him as part of the plan, they would never be in the same room again, but they said, screw that. Let's meet up at the old bar and have a good old chat. Except turns out the prediction was true. They're not actually here together. It's a high tech Zoom meeting. Yo-Yo still working as an agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. with her new team, including minor characters Piper and Davis brought back as a life metal decoy. And now with her unlocked speed powers, she's one of the strongest super agents they got. Melinda May has retired from field work. She's decided to be an instructor at the new Coulson Shield Academy. Fitz and Simmons now also retired. They've had enough adventures to last multiple lifetimes. They finally live their happily ever after. Mac has not retired. He's still director of S.H.I.E.L.D. He's leading S.H.I.E.L.D. into the new era with their brand new helicarrier. All right. And Daisy Johnson, formerly the Hacker Sky turned inhuman super agent Quake. She's still dating Daniel Sousa and they're on their own special mission in space. Who knows what that's up to, but maybe one day Quake will make it into the Marvel movies. And as for Agent Coulson, well, he planned on shutting himself down when the mission was over, but Max sent him a gift, a newly refurbished Lola, complete with an epic new paint job and flying powers. Coulson figures he can always shut down later. He may as well go travel the world. And so it ends the way it began with Coulson's sweet flying car. And that's how Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. comes to an end. If you like this recap, hit that subscribe button for more of the best recaps of TV and movies. And if you love this recap, check out the join button and support the channel as a member.